Merry Christmas. This morning, we are going to continue what we began last week. If y'all were here with us last week, you know that we started this series by looking together at the truth that in Christ, we see God coming to us. In other words, in what we call the incarnation in Christmas, all that entails regarding deity, meaning God, taking on humanity, meaning man. Now this morning, we're going to turn and we're going to see Christmas from a different perspective. But before we do that, I want to give you some examples to kind of let you know what we will be discussing. The first example I want to talk to you about is, imagine with me that we are all children and we are in an orphanage. We are awaiting an adoption and here we are in this orphanage in need of adoption and we gather one with one another in the auditorium with the rest of the kids and here we are. We're all in here as a group of kids in the auditorium and there is a couple who begins to go throughout observing all the group of children. Here they are. They're here with us. They're, they're going in the midst of us. They're going down the aisles looking from child to child. And it's been a long time since you and I have seen any visitors in this orphanage and we are excited to acknowledge that someone has come to us. Now that someone has come to us, it leads us to experience something that before was drowned out by despair. And what is that? We experience for the first time in a long time some sort of hope. We have been together in this, in this orphanage for a long time. Nobody's come. So here we are, and somebody has finally come to us. And as they come by you, they walk by you, and then they walk by me, and they walk by all of us, and then they leave the door. What happens? Your hope is dashed. Then to go back to despair. Now you're grateful that they came. Even for a moment, you may have been grateful in that moment that, man, I got to feel hope again. I haven't felt that way in a long time. But then you find yourself going about your normal lives, grateful for having guests in your, uh, in your presence, in your midst. Reminds me of the time where this past week when we went into the nursing home and we were singing carols up and down the hallways and, and it was something to have. You could see it on their faces of all the people in the nursing homes. It was something to have somebody to come to them. But I want to ask this, then... So they leave, the door is shut behind us, and here we are, we're all back looking at one another, realizing that we are here together. And then all of a sudden, the doors open, and standing at the door, the couple says to all of us, we did not merely come to you, we have now come for you. What happens in the heart of a child when they come to see that? What happens in your heart when you hear that? Joy! Yes, gratitude, gratefulness, overwhelming amounts of, of thought. When I went into the nursing home, it was one thing to walk down the hallways and sing. Oh, but when man, when they asked you to come into their room, they wanted you to not only come to them, they wanted you to come for them. I want us to imagine that someone we know is lying in a hospital bed and the alarms have sounded and the line is no longer in rhythm but the line is now flat and the doctor is outside the door and the doctor walks into the room, checks the chart and says, hey, I've come to you but you're not my patient so I can't do anything for you. Your loved one needs more than merely a doctor coming to him. He needs a doctor to come for him. Now, last week, we saw something amazing. We saw God coming to us. And for those of you who may be visiting with us this morning, uh, you can find it on YouTube, you can find it on our website, you can find it on uh, our, our Facebook page. You can go back and research if you wanted to hear that message that we saw of God coming to us. Really the apologetic of the reality that God became incarnate, that God took on flesh. But I have good news for us, church. He did not merely just come to us. He came for us. Oh, my heart does something when I hear that God came for me. 
not just to me. This morning, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to see in Christmas that God came for us. And we're going to look at a passage, by the way, that typically is not a Christmas passage. We're going to turn in your Bibles to the book of Galatians, if you will turn there with me. The book of Galatians, chapter 4, and I will be reading verses 4 through 7. Galatians chapter 4, reading in verses 4 through 7. I want to remind you that as you, as we read this together, that if you are visiting with us, that we believe that what we are about to read is the inspired, infallible, and errant Word of God. And if it is so, then may our lives be forever changed by it. And may we live as genuine people who not only see this Word as being that, but obey this Word as that. God help us to do that. Galatians chapter 4, I'll be reading verses 4 through 7. This is the Word of God. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Let us pray. We come to You because You are a good, good Father. You are the giver of the best gifts. I often wonder, God, what I should give to You for the gift of gifts. That You would give Your Son, begotten, not created, to be our Redeemer, our Substitute. The idea that He took on humanity, His humility is incomprehensible. The infinity of His love beyond my heart's ability to even even fathom it. He is the wonder of wonders. That Jesus, You came below to raise me above. You came to be born like me that I might become like You. Realizing that in love I cannot rise to You unless You draw near the wings of grace to me to raise me up to You. God, that in power, deity took on humanity. That in wisdom, when I was yet a sinner in need of salvation and in need of help, with no way to come to You, no ability to come to You, You came, God, You became incarnate to save me came as a man to die my death, shed blood on my behalf, and to work out perfect righteousness. God, we, we now see a gift in Christmas that we so often take for granted. So God, I pray that if there are ears to hear this morning, let them hear. Let us hear good tidings of great joy. And in hearing, may we believe. And in believing, may we rejoice. May our conscience be bathed in rest as we are grateful for the greatest of all gifts this Christmas day. A baby born in a manger that would grow to die on a cross. And in three days be raised, risen again. For it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. God is good. Ladies and gentlemen, we draw from this passage on the eve of Christmas because it describes for us not just that Jesus came to us, but that He came for us. So we're going to look at this through three realities. We're going to look at it through the timing of Christmas. I want you to see that there was a timing in this. We're going to look at it through the coming of Christmas. And we're also going to look at it for the purpose of Christmas. And this is my hope this morning, that as we will leave this place, that 
we would but pause in the midst of giving our gifts, in the midst of our celebrating all these things, that we would remember the timing of Christmas, the coming of Christmas, and the purpose of Christmas. So first, the timing of Christmas, verse 4 reveals to us, it begins with, the fullness of the time came. The fullness of the time came. This is so important. This reveals to us that time is linear. It had a definite beginning and it is progressing toward a definite end. It is when the time had come to the point of fullness or the point in the moment in time that was determined by God's eternal decree that He would intervene. It is that moment that God before the foundations of the world said that He would come. Ladies and gentlemen, herein lies the truth of the miraculous. This is the truth of what we consider to be a miracle. A miracle is when God, who is outside of time and space, becomes a causative agent inside of time and space. You know, I, when I begin to speak about miracles, this is when many in the scientific world begin to raise their heads to me. Even in the church. They begin to become confused about what a miracle is. But I want to be clear. I want you to hear the argument from God's Word. And it is this, that a miracle is not the stopping of nature. The miracle is not working against science. Because by Definition, a miracle is not natural. By definition, a miracle is introducing something that is supernatural. This doesn't make the miraculous against science no more than any description of agency is against the law of nature. Now let me explain this to you. Let me try to put this to you in a, in a framework. I'm going to go to your house and I'm going to put $500 in your drawer. Okay? I'm going to put $500 in your drawer. And then me and you are going to go off for a while. And we're going to come back. And we're going to say, and we're going to go back to that drawer. And now we only find $200. Now, would you say that the laws of nature have been broken? Or would you say the laws of Florida have been broken? As a matter of fact, the laws of nature are so consistent that you would not think in any moment, shape, or time that it was natural by nature for that money to be removed from your drawer. There had to be a causative agent to go into that drawer and to take that money out. Amen? Okay. As a matter of fact, the laws of nature are so rhythmic, so natural, that you would say something super natural in that moment had to come in and remove that. You see, the, law, the mechanism isn't challenged by agency. No, it is agency and mechanism working simultaneously. In other words, it is this. If I were to ask you, how does a, how does a car, how did a car come to be? Some of you would answer by the laws of internal combustion. Would that be true? Yes. Yes, the only way a car can go is by the law of internal combustion, this law of nature. But I would also argue that the way a car came to be is by the man by the name of Henry Ford. Now, if I were to give you the example of Henry Ford, does that mean that that disqualifies the laws of internal combustion? No, 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 no. You see, they're not separate, they're together. And this is what we see in a miracle. We are not saying that the laws of nature have stopped. We are saying that God, the creator of the laws of nature, has now entered into time and space and became a causative agent to change things. And this, amen, and this is what happens on that Christmas morning. Laws of nature that makes us acknowledge that someone somewhere has intervened. In Christmas, it is the eternal God invading, if you will, time and space. Now, I, I hear this all the time, especially from some of my unbelieving friends. Well, you know, they weren't scientific back then. They weren't as scientific as we are today. And I want you to know that's, that's totally true. You're right. But they weren't stupid either. 
They knew dead people didn't raise from the dead. If that were the case, if they thought dead people raised from the dead all the time, Jesus' resurrection wouldn't have been a big deal. But they knew something had happened. They know that virgins don't have babies. If they knew that, Joseph wouldn't have needed an angel to come and tell him she's been miraculously conceived. You see, yeah, they didn't have a lot of the scientific things we have today, but some things they did have, which is what, what we like to call, from, from where I'm from, it's just common horse sense. Y'all ready? We all with me, right? I don't need a degree because I ain't got one to know that dead people don't naturally raise from the dead. I don't need a degree because I ain't got one to let you know that virgins don't have babies. I know this. So in order for Christmas to happen, something had to enter time and space as a causative agent to bring about something that is supernatural. Is everybody with me? And it is this reality that time is fully under God's provision and sovereignty. And by the way, this is standard Pauline theology. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul said it was at the right time that Christ died for the ungodly. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, Paul argues that he has made from one man every nation of mankind to dwell on all the face of the earth, having determined, listen, their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of, the, uh, of their dwellings that they would seek God. And Paul's going to end this argument by adding another. He says, God calls men to repent because what? He has fixed a day. He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness. Through who? Through Jesus. Through the One who was raised from the dead. Now, some of you may be asking, well, why did God decide at this time at this time. Now there's a lot of conjecture on this. Sometimes when people ask me these questions, I often ask them back, why would God have to come during this time? And oftentimes it has to come with technological advances. You know, we'd be able to get Jesus on television screens. As though seeing is believing. Hey look, people saw what Jesus did in that day. Did they believe? No, no, no. You see, you see, this is our false reality. Our false reality, man, if I could just see it, I would believe it. Well, then we don't understand that we never read the Bible because the Bible clearly states that people saw it and didn't believe it. Matter of fact, when Jesus gave them the truth of who He was and what He was doing, many of them left Him. Jesus was the best at doing what we don't like to do, which is called pruning the church, right? He was good at it, man. He had thousands of people following Him. They said, you're going to have to give your life for this. Oh, they were done with that. I know what he's talking about. Some of us say, why didn't he come as an American? I can tell you why, but I'm not going to. Because I'm going to tell you what we would have done if Jesus would have came as an American. We would have made the whole world become American. We would have tried to dominate the world by being American. I want you to consider this for a moment that Palestine was uniquely positioned for the gospel to now launch a global movement. The Jews were expecting a Messiah through the prophecies of Micah and Isaiah, so the, the expectation was there. There's a renewed security and a peace they offered the people relative safely in their travels, also known as the Pax Romana. Due to Rome coming and offering peace, there was now this, this internet, the first the first interstate system really to be developed, the first internet system to be developed where transportation was be able to be done. There was a common language now known as, uh, I'm just going to use Greek, let me just say Greek. There was a common Greek language now that was being used so that it could be able to be presented a very uncommon message. The mythological gods of Greece and Rome were beginning to waver in culture. So historically the time was right. And Jesus enters into this, and in Mark 1.15, you can find this for yourself, it, Jesus comes in and He says, the time, listen to how Jesus explains it, the time is fulfilled 
and the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he says this, repeat, repent and believe in the Gospel. I agree with what one old pastor said, and this is what he said is, quote, By fullness of time, we know that the time which had been ordained by the providence of God was seasonable and fit. It was fit for there for the right time for the Son of God to be revealed to the world was for God alone to judge and determine, unquote. And to that I say, Amen. So here, ladies and gentlemen, in God's providence and wisdom from before creation, the plan had been set for this time. For God to come, for Jesus to come at this time. And next, so first we have the timing of Christmas, and now we have the coming of Christmas. And it is here that we get three descriptions, descriptors of the coming of Christmas. And first, it says here, it says, but when the fullness of time come, the first description it gives us is God sent forth His Son. I want you to notice the word here, sent forth. It is one word. It means to send out from a previous state. Did you hear that? To send out from a previous state. It literally translates to be sent on a mission. To be sent on a mission. Jesus coming is literally describing for us the missio dei. The mission of God. God being on mission to redeem those who would believe in Him. The Son, eternally existing with the Father, He did not begin to be the Son of God at Bethlehem. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, because this is what the cults believe. He did not begin to be the Son of God at Bethlehem. He did not begin to be God at the resurrection. He did not begin to be God at the ascension. He was, he, he was eternally the Son of God and existed with the Father from eternity past. Isaiah would say it like this, that a child will be born, a son will be given. The child is what was born. The son always existed and he would be given in this child. This is not God sending a substitute or a surrogate, but it is God Himself coming. It is the very story of God's most missional moment. It is not God sending a baby from a manger to a cross. It is very God of very God taking on very flesh and becoming very man and coming to earth. It is letting us know the life of Christ did not start in Bethlehem. And Paul would, Pilate, excuse me, would come to Jesus and he would ask Jesus, where did you come from? Pilate, here's Jesus standing before this man and and he would ask Jesus, where did you come from? And what what was Jesus' response? Silent. Why would Jesus be silent when he asked that question? We ain't got enough time to describe this to you, Pilate. We've got work to do. You try explaining this. Oh, let me tell you something. Ladies and gentlemen, church. First, let me speak to the church. Church, we must embrace the paradox and the mystery because it's in the mystery that we find deity. That we find the miraculous reality of Christmas. And if you're in here and you're an unbeliever, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, you've enjoyed many Christmases of the idea of who Christ is in this, you're like, you're like Talladega Nights, right? You like the baby Jesus. Huh? Well, I want you to know the baby Jesus grew up to be the adult Jesus who died on a cross, who became the resurrected Jesus, who is now the risen Jesus. Who is now the reigning Jesus? Who will become the returning Jesus? And that is, that is Jesus. Let us try to explain this. I don't know how, without ceasing to be what He was, God, He became He what He wasn't man. The Christmas carol says it like this. It says, Lo, within a manger lies He who built the starry skies. No other child could we say such a thing. And ladies and gentlemen, this is central to the Christian message. This is, 
This is central to Christianity. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, For us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we exist through Him. Colossians 1, 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So ladies and gentlemen, it is here in Jesus we see the eternal deity, but we also see divine intentionality. This was not an accidental occurrence in order to fix an, some unforeseen error. In other words, this is what I'm trying to get at. Jesus coming on Christmas was not God trying to fix an oops. God doesn't say oops. He knew. The Incarnation Church is the fulfillment of prophecy. And it's the culmination of a plan devised with the eternal counsel of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, before the foundation of the world. Now, you want your mind to be amazed? Think of this. That in the Trinity, where there is perfect unity and perfect diversity, in the Trinity, where there is love, perfection, where there is community, perfection, where there is unity, perfection, right? In the Trinity, they decided, the Trinity, He, God, the Trinity, decided to create man in His image, in His likeness, knowing that in order to create man, they would have to give them the freedom to obey or not to obey, knowing that they wouldn't obey, knowing that they would end up sitting in the long run, knowing that the Son would have to come and die on the cross. I'm telling you, church, Christmas is more than God coming to you. Christmas is God coming for That's good news. That's good news. So the first thing we see here in the coming of Christmas is His divinity, but the second thing we see is His humanity. It says, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. Born of a woman. Born under the law. Born of a woman was the expression used to describe one who is human. The focus of this passage is on the full participation of Christ in humanity. A supernatural conception, but a very natural birth. I gotta be honest with you. I struggle with the hymn, the old song, Silent Night. I don't think it was a silent night. I've had three kids. I, let me, let me correct that. She had three of my children. And it was nothing but a silent night. You hear me? I think what we've done with some of our Christmas, uh, emotionalism is we have removed the humanity of Jesus. He didn't come out like this. He came out, ah, I believe it. He came out fully baby. That's humanity. That's, that's God coming in the flesh. And by the way, this is a direct reference back to what we call the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3.15. The promised, remember? Uh, if you don't know, let's go there. Let's go there just because we're at Christmas Eve, okay? Uh, I was going to do it even if at Christmas Eve. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. God has created, man has sinned, man, Adam and Eve have sinned. God is now revealing the punishment of the people, but in that punishment, He reveals the fact that He was going to provide a salvation. Let's look at 14, verse 14 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than any every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your lives. And I will put enmity, which basically means combat, between you and the woman. Look, notice, and between your seed and her seed. Seed is singular. Now, watch the very next verse because this is important. He is about to tell us who that seed is. Watch. Between your seed and her seed, he. That, by the way, if you want to read that in the Hebrew, that is a singular male. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. 
Now, if I, could, if I had time, I'd take you to Isaiah 53 and let you see that. But if you want to just write that out there, you're more than welcome to do that. Go to Isaiah 53, see what Isaiah sees about this. And then we come to Jesus and we see right here what is Paul explaining. That this is, Jesus is the promised seed of the woman. So in humanity, we find, I mean in deity, we find he was sent forth his son. In humanity, he was born of a woman, but he was also born under the law. Not only a man, but he was born a Jewish man. He was circumcised on the eighth day, growing up in a very Jewish home, reading in a very Jewish Torah, praying to a heavenly father, attending very Jewish synagogues, faithfully, faithfully, by the way, fulfilling the law as no one before him had ever done. He always acted in perfect freedom and obedience to the Father. Born under the law. What does that mean? Have you ever thought what it meant for him to be born under the law? It means this, that in his humanity, in Jesus' humanity, he was born under the Jewish law, having a Jewish mother living in a Jewish nation. Therefore, He was called to keep the law in perfection and fulfill the law in personification. The law was never meant to be a ladder to climb. It was meant to be a mirror to observe ourselves in. I'm not going to repeat the sermon that I repeated a few weeks ago. But listen to me, church. The law is meant to be a mirror to see ourselves, to see how broken we are, to see how marred we are, to see how dirty we are. I trust, trust me, if you ever go to a mirror for cleansing, you are going to be scarred and broken. And this is what we've done in the church. We've created legalism. The law shows us that we are broken and now we expect that law to cleanse us. No, ladies and gentlemen. The law shows us that we are broken so that we can go to someone else for cleansing. And I want to tell you that the blood has been shed for your cleansing. The redemption has been made. Jesus is your Savior. The law was meant, never meant to be a ladder to climb, but a mirror to see how broken we are and need of summing, someone to redeem us. And the only way someone could redeem us is if someone was able to fulfill and hold the law perfectly. And only Jesus was able to achieve that. I remember listening to an unbeliever one time and we were sitting there talking about this. And he goes, man, do you know there's a million people who would be able to fulfill the promises of the Old Testament? There's many, many people who would be able to fulfill all those prophecies. He said, have you lost your mind? Have you read the Old Testament? With due respect. With due respect. And I did. We were sitting, guess where we were sitting? Chick-fil-A. We're sitting there and we're talking. I said, with all due respect, have you read the Bible? Have you read the Old Testament? He would, he would have to come from the lineage of David. He would have to come from Bethlehem. He'd have to be born of a virgin. Have you read all this? He would have to fulfill the law perfectly. He would have, you know, all he would need to do is to die and raise again on the third day like he said he would. Do you know how many people have fulfilled that? One. Feet only Jesus was able to achieve succeeding in what no one else could or ever would or ever will. He came under the law because being under the law, He would be able to fulfill the precept of the law as our representative. He came under the law because being able to fulfill the precept of the law, He would exhaust the penalty of the law as our substitute. The reason the Christian holds, listen to me please ladies and gentlemen, this is extremely important to me because I've heard it said in our culture that you, you Christians are mightily exclusivistic, which means that you exclude everybody. Listen to me. Every religion is exclusivistic. Even the inclusivist excludes the exclusivist. I want you to know that there is, there is no argument for me that we are exclusivistic. 
In other words, there is no argument for me that we say that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. I don't argue. I don't, I don't back away from that from a moment. But I want you to know why. Why is it that we hold to the exclusive, exclusivity of Christ? It's not because we are arrogant. It is because we believe that He is the only one qualified to be our Savior. The point is this, is that if God must save, then the Savior must be God. If a man must bear the punishment for sin, then the Savior must also be a man. And if the Savior be a man, then that man, in order to bear the punishment for sin, must be sinless. Who is capable of such a thing? Christ alone. See, it is here we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world and from this modern idea that all religions are fundamentally the same but superficially different. That is, that is so untrue. They are superficially the same and fundamentally different. The Hindu would say God has been incarnated on multiple occasions and the Christian says the incarnation is a unique event. The Jews would say that Jesus is not the Messiah. Christianity says He is. In Islam, whose symbol is scales, the good must outweigh the bad and there is no assurance of salvation. In Christianity, the symbol is a cross where Christ bore the punishment so that by grace we have been saved through faith and in Christ we can know in whom we have believed and we can know that He alone is faithful. Do not walk out of here believing that Christmas is the same for every religion. It is not true. And lastly, this morning, first we saw the fact of the timing of Christmas. The second thing we saw was the coming of Christmas. And now lastly, I want us to see the purpose of Christmas. Verse 4 and 5. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Verse 5. So that, here's the purpose, so that He might redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Two words. Two words that I want you to wrap in your mind for tomorrow morning and for the days ahead. Redemption and adoption. Redemption first. In chapter 3, verse 13, he said that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What is the idea? What is going on here? What is going on here? Here's what's going on. It's the idea of what the law does. Ladies and gentlemen, I've already explained this in part, but when we are confronted by the law, it helps us realize the mess we are in and any attempt on our part to fix, our, fix ourselves is futile. And Christ comes. He pays our debts. He takes the curse of the law, which is death. For the wages of sin is death. We are redeemed from the system of self-justification. I believe that one of the most freeing things for the church today is this truth. You are redeemed. If you are in Christ, you are now redeemed from a system of self-justification. You no longer have to go about trying to justify yourself. Jesus has already done that for you. Now all you do is live in the midst and in the presence of that justification. The purpose and goal of His incarnation is as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, so that God could condemn sin in the flesh and receive as righteous all those who find in Christ Jesus the sole and sufficient substitute for the sin that they owe but could not pay. Christ became a curse for us. Do you think about that on Christmas? That He would take on flesh and become a curse for us? He took on Himself not only the calling of man,
but the responsibility of men. Church, we are redeemed so that we may then be adopted into His family. Did y'all hear me? You have been redeemed so that you may be adopted. An adoption that fills all time. Have you ever thought about this? I'm going I'm to end on this. Listen to me. I want you to see this. This is so important. I want you to see that your adoption, that your adoption fills all time. First Corinth, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. You can just write this in your notes. I'm going to read this to you. I want you to see that your adoption, an adoption that is rooted in time past by God's sovereignty. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5. He said, He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. He predestined us to adoptions as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself. An adoption that is rooted in God's sovereignty, but it, so it encompasses all of our time past. But it also encompasses all of our future. This is Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23 when He says, And not only this, but also we have ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even when we ourselves groan within ourselves, listen, waiting eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So we see adoption in the past, we see adoption in the future, and now what I want you to see is the adoption in the present. Romans 8.15 when he says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoptions as sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. Have you heard this before? Go back with me to Galatians chapter 4. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His sons into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Your adoption was rooted in the past, preparing you for a future so that you can live in the present. Church, your adoption is all in all, fulfilling all of time. And to that the church says, Amen and Amen. This is why when we participate in what we see as Christmas, this is an event happening in the past, fulfilling our present for a future hope. Why? Why do we participate in the Lord's Supper on a regular basis? Because it is in the Lord's Supper that we are able to see all of time fulfilled. Listen, it says, For as often as you drink this bread and drink this cup, in the present, as often as you do it in the present, you proclaim the Lord's death in the past until He comes in the future. You see, the Lord's Supper is, is doing all. It's, it's encompassing all of time. It's reminding us of our adoption in the past, in the present, in the future. It is because of this adoption, by the way, that God has sent forth the Spirit of His sons into our hearts, now giving us the ability to cry out, Abba, Father. You can't call someone your father unless you have been adopted into that family. Church, we have the privilege of now being able to call out. One of my favorite, favorite things to think about is this. I want you to know that the father planned it, the son executed it, and the spirit applies it. Father planned it, the Son executed it, and here we have the Spirit applied it. From start to finish. Church, never forget this point. Because if you don't, you will walk out of this room still trying to earn a salvation that has been freely given to you. So let me tell you, from start to finish, salvation belongs to the Lord. It is by grace you have been saved through faith so that it is not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. So to this, what do we do? To this we come and we are able to say Merry Christmas. 
For on this day, we celebrate the birth of a child, the incarnation of God in the flesh, the very incarnate deity who has redeemed us, and because of that redemption, we have been adopted as sons. I want to remind you that the very word Christmas is the combination of Christ and Mass. Mass, which when literally translated, comes from the word that means, guess what? To be sent on mission. Christ. Coming in the flesh, sent on his own mission to redeem those of us who would then, therefore, be sent on mission. Christ is the dawning of Christ's mission. My hope this morning is that this Christmas would be new for someone. That in the Christ coming for us, you in this room, or maybe you're listening by way of YouTube or Facebook. My hope is that in the coming of Christ, you would find redemption and adoption. And that I would really be able to say to you, Merry Christmas. And every time that we in this season are able to say Merry Christmas, that in our hearts and in our minds we would be reminded that what we are telling them is we want you to have joy for Christ has come to us. And now He wants to do through us what He has done to us. So church, I say to you from the depths of my heart, Merry Christmas. Let us stand. Come behold the wondrous mystery. The idea of God becoming flesh. That in Christmas we are seeing Christ fulfilling His promise, being sent on mission to redeem and adopt those who are His. So this morning I come to praise You, Jesus. Thankful for Your grace and Your mercy and Your goodness. God, I am so grateful that You came for me. I am amazed that You merely came to me that is in and of itself something to be in awe and, and in shock over. But God, not only to know that You came to me, but to know that You came for me. Ah, to this the church sings and rejoices and praises. And to this, our constant response and repose is Merry Christmas to all. Father, be with us this morning. I pray, God, that if there is somebody in here who does not know You as Lord and Savior, that today would be a merry Christmas Eve for them. That for the first time tomorrow, they would truly be able to be having, be able to have a merry Christmas. And that, Father, for those of us who are Yours, that we would be reminded, because we so quickly forget of all that is entailed on this Christmas day. Jesus, draw us to Yourself. May You be worshipped in spirit and in truth. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.